Megan Saronsky, I am really, really excited about this panel on state level climate action that we have. This entire day is just full of amazing speakers of folks who are right in the mix of all of the really, really exciting things that are happening on climate policy at the state level. And I'm getting a lot of really interesting pantomiming happening from this table here in the front. Do you want me to be louder? Okay. Can you hear me in the back? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. I'm Megan. You just missed the rest of everything, but that's okay. Um, really, really excited about this panel. You've got your, their bios uh, in front of you, so I am just going to tell you my favorite part about their bios. Um, just to warm everybody up for the fantastic discussion we are going to have. Um, first up, we will have Leslie Janterosamy. How did I do? That was good. That was good? Excellent. Okay. Leslie is the Senior Climate Policy Analyst at the Oregon Department of Energy, leading that state's climate change policy work. Um, also, this is my favorite part of her background. She served on a steering committee for the interagency U.S. Global Change Research Program and still serves as a chapter lead author for the upcoming fourth National Climate Assessment Report. If you don't follow those reports, they are incredible resources collecting the sort of state-of-the-art research on climate change and particularly as it relates to the United States. It's a hugely, hugely important endeavor. Um, so thank you for that work. Next to Leslie, we have Ignacia Moreno, who uh, was appointed in 2016 by Governor Terry McAuliffe in Virginia to serve on the Virginia State Air Pollution Control Board, uh, which is obviously in the middle of some incredibly interesting work on climate right now that we will hear about. Uh, Ignacia also served as the Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and Natural Resources Division of the Department of Justice uh, and led their work on Deepwater Horizon, which was obviously an incredibly important uh, and challenging uh, period of time. Next to Ignacia, we have Ellen Peter, who is the Chief Counsel of the California Air Resources Board. Ellen has been at the center of the work in California, which has obviously led the way for the entire country on climate over the past uh, number of years. Ellen also led the litigation team that defended the Pavley greenhouse gas, um, or the, sorry, the Pavley greenhouse gas vehicle standards uh, in a number of different litigation venues, uh, which was an incredible contribution to laying the foundation for what uh, has come since that time. And then we have Katie Theoherides. Theoherides, either one. Theoherides, <laughs> yes. I ruined that yeah. one, I apologies. Theoherides. Uh, Katie is Assistant Secretary of Climate Change in the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, where she is working and leading their climate change program, which again is a really dynamic, um, place and time for policy change right now. Uh, and, and Katie originally trained as a field ecologist, uh, which is, it's great to have, it's always great to have a scientist uh, in the room when you have this many lawyers and perhaps we should have more scientists. So I will, I will turn it over right now to Leslie. And see if this works, if you can all hear me without me holding it, because I have to work the slides. Is that okay? All right. Okay, so I am thrilled to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting Oregon, and I'm here on behalf of the governor's uh, energy advisor, and I work for the Oregon Department of Energy, um, but I'm taking a, a broader view of advancing climate action uh, in Oregon. So under Governor Kate Brown's leadership, Oregon continues to step up and do our part to address climate change. The governor said that this poses the greatest threat to Oregon's environment, economy, and way of life. We are part of the U.S. Climate Alliance, which you heard a little bit about. It's uh, just last week at Climate Week NYC, um, the 14th partner joined the alliance, um, bringing the total to 14 states and Puerto Rico. And so along with other members of the U.S. Climate Alliance, our governor will be traveling to Bonn in November to take part in the subnational leadership talks at COP23, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, Oregon's also a founding member of the Under Two Coalition, which is a global pact of 187 cities, states, and countries around the world committed to limiting global average temperature increases to well below two degrees Celsius. And Oregon, California, Washington, and British Columbia uh, together founded the Pacific Coast Collaborative, which is a regional climate and energy leadership forum that provides 
a formal basis for information sharing, cooperative action, uh, and a common voice on the issues that affect our region in the West. And then just looking within our state borders, Oregon is committed to working collaboratively with our Native American tribal partners, our local county and city governments, uh, ensuring that we have both rural and urban perspectives uh, that have a seat at the table, and that we have equity at the forefront of our minds um, so that uh, what we do with climate change policy, um, regardless of race, ethnicity, income level, or where you're living in our state, uh, they can all benefit from climate action. And the consequences of climate change are already impacting our communities. They're threatening the long-term sustainability of the many natural resource-based economies that are in Oregon. Um, and Oregon cities are also stepping up to do their part. A dozen have signed the We Are Still In uh, declaration, and um, they are, or are part of the U.S. Uh, mayors, climate mayors coalition of cities that have pledged to uphold the Paris Agreement. Um, and in particular, the city of Portland uh, is a recognized national leader in climate action. It's developed the uh, first citywide climate action plan in the nation back in 1993. What were you doing in 1993? <laughs> Uh, so, regularly working with their city counterparts in initiatives like the C40 uh, Cities Climate Leadership Group and the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. Um, but at the same time as we recognize and celebrate all of this positive momentum, we know that there's still a lot more to do and that more progress is needed. So the, the next couple of slides will be going through some of the key tools that Oregon um, is using to drive down our greenhouse gas emissions in the sectors that contribute most uh, to carbon pollution in our state. And um, just, this isn't intended to be a comprehensive list, it's really just uh, highlights, because otherwise I'll get yanked off the stage if I stay up here for 30 minutes. Um, so, uh, the first is transportation. Um, transportation is the largest contributor to Oregon's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it, it, not only are we uh, seeing as, you know, vehicle efficiencies have increased, um, at the same time, emissions from the sector have increased. So what does that mean? That means more people are driving. We have more people moving to Oregon, obviously, but it also means vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, has been increasing over time. So what are the policies and the, the tools that we can use to address not only decarbonizing the fuel that drives uh, a, a transportation in the state, but also how do we just get people out of their cars? Um, Oregon's Clean Fuels program is modeled after programs in California and British Columbia. It requires a 10% reduction in the life cycle carbon intensity of the state's transportation fuels. Um, and the, this could be from conventional replacements for gasoline, such as uh, ethanol, biodiesel, propane, um, or you know, moving to kind of thinking about the more next generation fuels, electricity, and renewable natural gas. Um, and so this program is designed to spur innovation in um, commercialization uh, of low carbon fuels that are needed to achieve the deep decarbonization that we need um, to meet Oregon's long-term climate change commitments. Uh, Oregon has also adopted California's program for zero emissions vehicles and they're part of the multi-state um, ZEV, zero, zero Emission Vehicles Action Plan, uh, which provides a coordinated approach to addressing barriers to adoption of ZEVs. So there, as part of this, there's a, a zero emission vehicle rule that requires automaker, automakers to sell increasing numbers of ZEVs. Um, and in, in the first six months of 2017, um, the number of ZEVs registered in Oregon increased by over 70%. So uh, we project that at least 8% of new vehicle sales um, will be ZEVs by 2025. And then in addition, uh, the last panel you heard actually talked a lot about electrification or a little bit um, on uh, the need for uh, increasing charging availability. And, and, and actually a law passed last year in Oregon where the state's largest electric utilities um, are required to speed the deployment of charging stations for electric vehicles. So I think, you know, like uh, states like Ohio, our PUC is grappling with the same issues about the role, what are the roles uh, for utilities in electric vehicle charging. Uh, there there uh, was a, uh, it, just this past legislative session in, in July, a passed a uh, $5.3 billion transportation package, which um, will fund uh, investments in um, transit, public transit, um, upgrades throughout the state, about a, a billion dollars in, in transit funding, and it also provides uh, funding um, that will generate up to $12 million a year through 2023 to provide uh, zero emission vehicle rebates 
um, up to $2,500 for the purchase or lease of certain uh, vehicle models. Um, so that's the ZEV rebate program. And then the charge ahead rebate is actually providing a second rebate on top of that to um, incentivize low and moderate income households to buy or lease newer used um, ZEVs uh, and providing more access to, to those who um, voluntarily swap out cars that are uh, over 20 years old. Um, and then something I wanted to mention in terms of transportation and land use, I mentioned the vehicle miles traveled and the fact that Oregon has a very strong and, and uh, long history of being involved in land use planning. And this really has the benefit of uh, creating urban growth boundaries and population centers uh, of density or, or um, concentrating density and growth in certain areas that allow for more transit, allow for uh, a reduction in vehicle miles traveled when, when you have walkable, bikeable, um, more transit friendly communities. So this, this idea of having climate friendly communities and smart growth or, or developing and, and designing communities with, according to uh, smart growth principles um, helps get people out of their cars and, and you know, also improves uh, quality of life in those communities. And then in general, Oregon's land use planning program since its inception in 1973 has uh, an estimated um, protection of 1.2 million acres of forest and agricultural land in Oregon. And in addition to kind of the, the vehicle miles traveled or, or smart growth, climate friendliness, uh, of this, it, it also um, has a carbon capture benefit. And so or, we're actively thinking about how um, our, our forest lands um, play into this climate space. Uh, next, I want to talk about decarbonizing Oregon's electricity. Uh, so last year, um, Oregon passed this coal to clean law. Uh, by 2030, large investor owned utilities in the state can no longer import electricity uh, from coal-fired power plants outside of the state. Um, so this is, a, this is the first kind of uh, law like this uh, in the nation it, uh, to eliminate this import. Um, the law also increased our renewable energy um, to 50% by 2040 uh, for our renewable portfolio standards. Um, and in addition, this is kind of coming in the backdrop of uh, that uh, Oregon's last remaining coal plant in the state will be retiring 20 years early um, in 2020. So by then we will really be, be free of coal fired uh, electricity. And so um, the, the RPS and uh, other policies to incentivize development of renewables are, are really key for filling that void in the um, resource mix, electricity resource mix of Oregon. Um, so we have uh, programs that target biomass, geothermal, solar, and wind power, as well as methane capture and, and reuse. Um, and then uh, the third uh, piece of this is that Oregon has had a CO2 standard for new energy facilities actually since 1997. Um, and this, this is basically requiring new energy facilities that apply for permits uh, in the state to pay for carbon offset pr projects. Um, if they exceed a certain level of emissions. So it's incentivizing people to propose when they come to the state for permits, um, the most efficient uh, power generating station as possible. Um, but then if they, if they are unable to, or, or for whatever reason, don't meet that standard, they pay into a, a program that um, invests in carbon offsets. Um, Finance and incentives play a huge role in uh, helping to spur uh, uh, clean energy uptake in the state. We've had since 1979 a small-scale energy loan program that author authorizes the issuance of state bonds um, and helps public, private, tribal uh, stakeholders uh, gain access to energy project capital uh, in the form of fixed rate long-term loans. Um, and these are for projects, qualified projects that invest in energy conservation, renewable energy, and alternative fuels. We also have a renewable energy development grant program that provides uh, up to 35% of the cost of uh, a project for um, businesses, organizations, um, others that will install and operate a renewable electricity production system. Uh, and then third, the uh, incentives of our state home oil weatherization program, our show program, um, offers cash payments to Oregon households um, for weatherization and energy conservation. Um, and these target uh, homes that primarily heat with fossil fuels, such as oil, uh, propane, kerosene, or butane. 
Um, finally, just a suite of energy efficiency uh, organs been in, in this space for a very long time. <clears throat> we have a number of programs that target uh, publicly funded or public buildings um, to kind of lead by example and have um, uh, our, our state you know, you know, buildings um, as energy efficient as possible. Uh, so we have a, a, a program called SEED, State Energy Efficient Design Program uh, for retrofits and best practices. It requires state buildings to build 20% above energy code for new construction or major renovations and it requires the reporting of building energy use. Um, and so this kind of uh, helps drive the marketplace towards greater adoption of energy efficiency. And then the schools program helps K through 12 public schools in Oregon to implement uh, energy efficiency, do energy audits, um, and develop energy management programs for schools. Um, and then a scoring, energy performance scoring, is, is about labels or benchmarks for building energy efficiency, efficiency and energy use. And uh, we require residential and com commercial energy performance scores uh, in the state um, require that uh, uh, reporting. And the city of Portland actually has a mandatory commercial benchmarking program that covers about 1,000 buildings in the city. And uh, this year we'll be implementing a new home energy score policy that um, uh, will score about 14,000 homes a year. The, uh, the 1.5 green energy technology program requires that 1.5% of the contract price of publicly funded uh, buildings goes towards some type of green energy technology. This could include solar or passive solar and daylighting systems or geothermal. And then finally, our building codes is actively uh, 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 leading and, and, and um, requires that the state uh, look at how to achieve net zero and carbon neutrality in buildings. There are currently um, two buildings in Oregon that uh, have been certified as net zero, um, but we're hoping that, that more um, join the way. And the state um, conducts these analyses to compare Oregon code to model energy codes, and the, the newest uh, 2017 code will achieve about a 9% savings over the previous version. So moving forward on energy efficiency. So future directions, um, we, we obviously want to build on this long history and success that we've had in these different aspects. Um, that are, are contributing to Oregon's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and kind of the, the biggest ticket item right now is that uh, our state legislature has a bill proposal uh, on the table for a carbon pricing mechanism. This would put a price um, through an economy-wide cap and investment, uh, is what we're calling it, cap and trade, um, market-based approach. And uh, the governor has, has come out and said that she supports it, she wants to work with the state legislature on getting this bill passed to set up a, a cap uh, and invest scheme. It would um, very likely link to the, the Western Climate Initiative, WCI, uh, that California, Ontario, and Quebec are in. And then, in general, because of our participation in the U.S. Climate Alliance, we, the uh, priority areas, um, actually the, the Alliance came out with a report last week at a uh, have and, coffee. Yeah, exactly. You'll probably hear more about this. Um, but they've identified four uh, major priority areas. So Oregon definitely wants to uh, to play its role and and um, see what kinds of innovations uh, it can bring in the spaces of uh, climate finance, which it would be about examining new insurance and risk mitigation approaches um, uh, in power market modernization. So we heard a lot about the electric utility regulators and. The, the need kind of for this community of practice that, that as we move towards the integrating these uh, renewable technologies and the emerging uh, technologies that are out there, how do we, how do we kind of move into the next uh, generation of, of clean energy and power markets? Um, and on, then in the buildings space, we want co coordinated policy action amongst our alliance states to drive development and design of new building engineering and construction models. And then hopefully these, this type of thing can be replicated right across the country. And then for advancing advanced transportation, this, this is about oh, church bells, uh, zero emission vehicle deployment and clean fuel development again. So we, we, we know where we want to go. We need to work together to harness this momentum. And we're very excited to, to be a part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. Ignacia?
Um, first, good afternoon. I'm delighted that you are here and a part of this uh, great conversation. I wanted to uh, uh, thank Ricky for inviting me to participate on this panel. I'm delighted uh, to join others in, in talking about the important roles of the states. And Megan, thank you for your kind introduction. I'm here today in my role as a member of the Virginia State Air Pollution Control Board. As you heard, I was appointed by Governor McAuliffe uh, to serve a four-year term until 2020. Needless to say, all of the opinions uh, that I express here today are solely my own, and the information that I will provide is in the public domain. And given where we are in the regulatory process that I will uh, describe in a few minutes, I'm going to hew very closely uh, to the facts of the recent state actions uh, by the uh, governor's, uh, governor's office and upcoming actions uh, by the State Air Pollution Control Board. So the Commonwealth of Virginia, if we look at the state of play, um, is taking a leadership role in addressing risks to human health, the environment, and w welfare posed by climate. Uh, this isn't uh, new. Uh, what's new is what we're considering, in fact, to do that. So as stated in a recent report uh, by a work group uh, that was established by the governor, uh, Virginia is uniquely positioned to become a leader in the international efforts to reduce carbon dioxide emissions and stave off the most dramatic consequences of climate change. Carbon dioxide emissions from Virginia's electric generating units are in fact trending down, and they have been for the last nine years. Uh, CO2 emissions from EGUs have fallen about 21%. Uh, there are some new plants that have come online, and there will be uh, an analysis of whether that trend down continues. Nonetheless, carbon dioxide emissions continue to account for about 30% of Virginia's overall uh, CO2 emissions. Another trend in Virginia is the growth in clean energy technologies, which have accelerated since 2014. According to the work group's report, Virginia's solar market is in the top 10 markets nationwide. In fact, energy efficiency business revenue in Virginia has increased from 300 million in 2013 to 1.5 billion in 2016, a five-fold increase. These two trends form the basis for recent executive actions by Governor McAuliffe to address the impacts of climate change through additional reductions in CO2 emissions and to promote long-term economic development through investments in the clean energy sector. By way of background, let me summarize some recent proactive and important steps taken by the governor, in particular in 2016, to meet these two goals. On June 28, 2016, Governor McAuliffe issued Executive Order 57. It's called the Development of Carbon Reduction Strategies for the Electric Power generation facilities. Executive Order 57 states that it is vital that the Commonwealth continue to facilitate and engage in a dialogue on carbon reduction methods while simultaneously creating a pathway for clean energy initiatives that will grow jobs and diversify Virginia's economy. Governor McAuliffe directed the Secretary of Natural Resources to convene a work group to study and formulate recommendations to achieve these two goals with input from interested stakeholders and consistent with existing legal authorities, such as the Virginia State Air Pollution Control Board's authority to promulgate regulations to abate, control, and prohibit air pollution in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Among other things, the executive order directed the secretary and work group to consider the establishment of regulations for reducing carbon pollution from existing electric power generation facilities. Also, to consider federal carbon reduction requirements at the federal level. And to consider a number of other things, uh, such as the impacts on the reliability 
of the electric system, the impacts on electric rates and electric bills, cost effectiveness, uh, the impacts on low income and vulnerable communities, implementation and administration of the regu regulations, economic development opportunities associated with the deployment of new carbon reduction technologies, and flexibility, among other things. With these principles and considerations in mind, Executive Order 57 directed the Secretary of Natural Resources to prepare a report with recommendations to the governor by May 31st, 2017. Subsequently, Virginia Secretary of Natural Resources Molly Ward convened a broad and diverse work group, including other cabinet secretaries and stakeholders from the nonprofit, business, academic, and scientific communities. The secretary conducted a robust process as called for in Executive Order 57, which included six public meetings over a six month period, a 90 day public comment period from February to April 2017, and consideration of about 8,000 written public comments that were received by the work group. The secretary submitted her report to the governor early on May 12, 2017, and made five broad categories of recommendations, including promulgating recommendations to uh, promulgating regulations to limit carbon dioxide emissions, establishing a statewide environmental justice advisory council, and other things, such as updating building codes and improving access to clean energy resources, like solar, wind, and other um, renewables. Developing an energy efficiency accounting and registry tool was also another one of the recommendations. As to the carbon regulations, the work group recommended that, and I'm going to quote, the governor consider taking action via a regulatory process to establish a trading ready carbon emissions reduction program for fossil fuel fired electric generating facilities that will enable participation in a broader established multi-state carbon market, end quote. Although the report acknowledges that many stakeholders commented on a specific in-state target, such as 30% reduction by 2030, the work group focused instead on what they considered important and necessary work in Virginia through a regional model, such as the established and successful REGI model, in order to achieve lower compliance costs and address the interstate nature of the electric grid. The work group considered comments on the question of whether the State Air Pollution Control Board and DEQ had existing legal authority to regulate carbon dioxide from electric power generation facilities. The conclusion was that the board has such authority, which was confirmed in an official advisory opinion issued by Ge uh, Attorney General Mark Herring on May 12th, 2017. In his opinion, Attorney General Herring stated that the board is the governmental entity legally authorized to regulate the emissions of air pollutants. <clears throat> he noted that the board exercises its authority by promulgating regulations to abate control and prohibit air pollution through any and all parts of the Commonwealth. Attorney General Herring also reaffirmed the board's authority to regulate greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, as an air pollutant under Virginia's PSD permitting program, which the board has done since 2011. More specifically, the Attorney General weighed in on the, um, on the recommendation of the work group and specifically found that the board is legally authorized to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, including establishing a statewide cap on GHG emissions for all new and existing fossil fuel electric generating plants. 
On May 16th, Governor McAuliffe issued Executive Directive 11. And I know this is a lot of nitty gritty, but I'm sharing some of the uh, key actions uh, taken by the governor uh, that form the basis for what the board is going to do next. So the governor in the directive specifically adopted the working group's recommendations and directed the Department of Environmental Quality in coordination with the Secretary of Natural Resources to develop a proposed regulation for the State Air Pollution Control Board's consideration and to include provisions to ensure Virginia's regulation is trading ready to allow for the use of market-based mechanisms and the trading of carbon dioxide allowances through a multi-state trading program like REGI. The governor also directed DEQ to present the proposed regulations to the Air Board for consideration for approval for public comment in accordance with the board's authority no later than December 31st, 2017. The regulations under development by DEQ for consideration will be subject to a formal and full rulemaking process. In June of this year, DEQ issued a notice of intended regulatory action and uh, filed that in the Virginia Register. And public comments were taken for a 30-day period. A regulatory advisory panel was convened. It has held thir uh, three meetings in the last number of months. Um, 40 presentations were made in August and September. And the minutes of the meetings of the RAP are on DEQ's website if you're interested in taking a look at the issues that were discussed. DEQ's proposed regulations will take into account everything that has come up through the RAP process and the um, public comment process. At a public meeting just last week of the Air Board, on September 21st, we received a status update from DEQ and a briefing on the REGI framework. The board will continue to be briefed and receive information as information <laughs> becomes available. There are a number of issues under consideration by DEQ which it will address in its proposal to the board, such as baseline years, the size of the cap or emissions budget, allocation of allowances, to whom and on what basis, approaches on auction mechanisms, as well as other related issues. At the September 21st meeting, the board also considered a citizen petition that sought the board, that requested that the board adopt regulations and promulgate an emergency rulemaking or formal rulemaking to limit and reduce CO2 emissions by 30% by 2030. The board unanimously denied the petition because of the ongoing regulatory process to address carbon dioxide emissions. The petitioner has the right to file another petition at a future date. So going forward, DEQ will continue to develop a regulatory proposal for consideration by the State Air Pollution Control Board. On a parallel track, DEQ will continue to confer with the REGI states, which are in the process of finalizing their own 2016 program review. And assuming that a regulatory proposal is presented as expected to the board, not in December, but on November 16th, the board will approve, deny, or seek additional information on the proposal at the meeting. If the board approves the regulatory proposal, the proposal will undergo executive review and will go to the governor for his approval. If it is approved, then it'll go to the Virginia Register of Regulations for publication in a 60-day comment period. I will spare you the nitty gritty of the Virginia Administrative Process Act, but there are many, many different steps and layers. 
Nonetheless, uh, the uh, DEQ expects that the uh, rule will be final if it proceeds in the expected course uh, by September of next year. That could, of course, get delayed till the end of the year. And there are a number of different junctures at which uh, the then sitting governor could pull back the process, or the legislature could pull back the process. Assuming everything goes forward, at the time that the regulations are final, uh, there will, of course, uh, be an opportunity for judicial review. DEQ has posted a lot of the information that I have shared with you today. I have kept it, as I said, very factual, given where we are in this process. Uh, but if you go to the uh, DEQ website under the Greenhouse Gas Plan, uh, you will have a lot of information, including some PowerPoints uh, that were um, considered by the board that were presented last week on issues um, in the REGI framework and possible linkages uh, to a Virginia program. So thank you once again for inviting me to this panel and I'll look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ignacia. As, as Ellen is making her way to the podium, um, if folks, if you have questions for, for amazing women who are at the center of what's happening in climate policy in four of the states that are at the cutting edge of what's happening in this country, please write them down and get them up to me because they're very likely to be more interesting than my questions. So make sure I get them. Thank you. So are you going to change the slides for me? I can. Okay. There it is. I can try. So thank you for inviting me here today. Um, on August 30th, 1967, then Governor Ronald Reagan established the California Air Resources <clears throat> Board. He signed a bipartisan bill, and what it was addressing was a serious public health danger, life-threatening levels of air pollution. Particularly in Los Angeles in 1967, there were 239 smog one and smog two air alerts. So last year, 2016, with more people and more vehicles in California, there were zero smog one and smog two air alerts. We've been making progress. So here we are 50 years later, and the California Air Resources Board, <coughs> known as CARB, is continuing its efforts against smog, uh, pr the pollutants that produce smog, and also we're intensifying our efforts that we started over a decade ago to reduce greenhouse gases. That's what I'd like to address here today. We're using regulations, plans, and incentives to push these greenhouse gases down. And we're working with our fellow states, with businesses, and with like-minded leaders around the country and around the world to do so. We are moving forward. So, under the Federal Clean Air Act, California has the authority to set its own vehicle emission standards. Starting with the catalytic converter, CARB has technology-driven standards which resulted in cleaner cars around California and around the world. I'll go back to that topic in a moment. Turning to refineries, power plants, and other large stationary sources, CARB's cap and trade program sets a cap and then pushes the emissions down through a trading system. This is the cheapest market-based system to force down greenhouse gases from industrial sources. However, the oil companies, Chamber of Commerce, and others <coughs> sued CARB right at the inception of the program. So we dealt with that litigation. This summer, the California Supreme Court affirmed that those claims were without merit. The following month, the legislature adopted an extension of the cap and trade program until at least 2030. That, once again, was a bipartisan effort because in California, there's a two-thirds vote uh, from each house to adopt the program. 
Along with the cap and trade extension, there was a companion statute and that addressed neighborhood level toxics and other pollutants. So these two programs work together. On renewable electricity, we are working as are the other states, and as we heard this morning from the commissioners, pushing down the sources from moving to renewable electricity, pushing down pollution. And our utilities are very supportive of the California program. Now emissions from the transportation sector can be addressed both by cleaning up cars and by cleaning up the fuel supply. So CARB has a low carbon fuel standard, which is mentioned also is in Oregon, and that is pushing down the carbon, decarbonizing the fuel. So by 2020, the pool of gasoline and diesel that powering transportation will be 10% cleaner. And once again, we're opening that up and pushing that standard down in the following years. Renewable diesel was a very surprising solution to the, um, to the low par carbon uh, fuel standard. That was not something that people expected. That was generated by that market, came to market, and other market-based solutions are also coming from that regulatory program. At the, at the inception of the low carbon fuel standard, CARB got sued again um, by the oil companies and by others, the corn ethanol industry. Um, that case was uh, decided by the Ninth Circuit several years ago. We won part of the case. Um, it, it got remanded back to the lower courts. Just last week, uh, the, again, the oil companies and the and industry uh, took the case to the Ninth Circuit on the remaining issues. But we are again pushing through on that with uh, amicus support from some of the other states and from our NGO uh, supporters. So turning to the freight sector, once again there's many opportunities for electrification of the freight sector. CARF has a multi-pronged strategy to address that. It reduces greenhouse gases and also reduces other pollutants to the neighbors of ports, warehouse distribution centers, and rail yards. Another element that we're looking at is the short-lived climate pollutants, or super pollutants. This has several features in this program, but the idea is to move, take dairy waste, other waste, take the methane emissions, turn it into electricity, and put it back into the system. It generates credits in the low carbon fuel uh, standard. So once again, we're using the market and incentives to drive the technologies bringing things into market. So there are many, many zero emission vehicles out there. They're hydrogen, they're electricity, they're plug-ins, and there's just a tremendous number there right now. Um, the automakers are announcing already this year what their plans are for going forward. Once again, more models, bigger uh, types, more different variety. So the result of these standards, um, these new models, the new conventional technologies are shown in this graph. The manufacturers for the several years are over complying with the current greenhouse gas standards. They're banking credits. Those credits will help carry you forward to meet the standards in future years. So in our view, the greenhouse gas standards are working very well. So what we're trying to do now is move past cars, move out of combustion. We should be looking at model year 2026 and beyond. The emission standards can continue to ratchet down and we should be continuing forward. In March of this year, CARB announced our plans to reopen to start the whole process for the model year 2026 and beyond. Lots of lead time for the auto manufacturers, that is the way that we proceed. So the goal ultimately is to move to electrification of the transportation system, first with light duty cars and then moving in as appropriate into heavy duty. However, there's a hiccup. Now, I would like to say the hiccup is that we don't have enough charging infrastructure 
to make this work. However, um, that's not the hiccup. The hiccup is the detour that we're now taking to reopen the model year 2022 to 2025 standards. This is known as the midterm review. And once again, the automakers, in our view, are underselling themselves. In the 1960s, they claimed they couldn't do catalytic converters. However, the automakers were successful. In the 2004-2009 litigation, the automakers claimed those greenhouse gas standards were too tough. No problem. The automakers did it. They were successful, and as you can see by that other slide, more than successful. 20% of the vehicles that were sold, the new vehicles that were sold last year, already meet the 2020 standard. So, as usual, the automakers are great. They're doing it. They're ahead of schedule. That's what we need to do, and we have to keep pushing forward. So last summer, a year ago, EPA, NHTSA, and CARB did a joint technical review, technical assessment, and what that process was was to say for the midterm review, do we need to change those standards? And it's the study from the summer of 2016 said, no, we're fine. In fact, you could make the standards tougher. So in short, when EPA came out early this year, January of 2017, and said the midterm review does not require any changes for model year 22 to 2025, that was, in our view, the correct decision. A couple months later, CARB did its own study in our March 2017 board hearing, and we discussed it, said no problem. We could make them tougher, but we won't. We'll just keep to continue and hold the line, and we'll start looking. The board said, staff, go look at 2026 and beyond. What can we do? However, in August, NHTSA and EPA put out some Federal Register notices and we're going to re-examine the, re, uh, the re midterm review determination and some other issues. So, as with the litigation in 2004 to 2009, California and the other states will submit comments and will proceed because we don't think there's any review, any revision needs to be done. There doesn't need to be any change. The automakers can do it. The standards that were agreed on in, in uh, 2012 were between California, the federal government, and the automakers. And they, we harmonized the federal and the state standards, and we have consistent standards. These should stand. These should continue. However, if they are relaxed, uh, California will go alone and along and have its own standards. But that's not our preference. We want to do the harmonization. We want to continue. And once again, we think the automakers can do it. They're underselling themselves. So one thing I want to turn to is the uh, methane studies that California is doing. And as you can see by these maps, uh, certain of the methane emissions come from oil and gas production facilities, from large dairies, and from large landfills. And you can see the concentration of, the, um, of these different sources. This was from uh, aerial surveillance that was conducted uh, by CARB along with NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, in California. So this is a series of flights that they've been doing to uh, map the methane emissions or the super, one of the super pollutants in California. These uh, studies show, serve a number of uh, separate purposes, and they're outlined in this slide. They both uh, detect methane leaks or large sources, and they also can evaluate related emissions. So for example, if you have a large methane leak from a uh, refinery, there could very well be um, a, a carcinogen benzene that is related, that's coming out at the same time. So these um, methane flights are going to be able to do a variety of um, things. And once again, part of our, our emphasis this year and continuing is to look at these related emissions. We look at greenhouse gases, we also look at toxics and other pollutants. 
So this kind of new technology is something that allows us to start looking at those kind of things and deliver emissions reductions. So um, the states represented um, on uh, this panel and other states have band together to protect each other's um, programs. Um, and because there is a lot of litigation against the states that are taking these actions and the states support each other. That's great, that's gonna continue. Um, however, there was another role thrust upon us um, in recent months to brief, file briefs or to intervene in lawsuits where uh, EPA and other federal agencies are abandoning existing rules or changing their positions in court. CARB, other states, and many NGOs are involved in this fight, and we're not, we're opposing any administrative walk back from existing regulations. There can be a re-examination process, there's no problem, people reevaluate rules, but you can't walk back from existing rules without taking action, and the states are opposing that. Also, if the rules are weakened without adequate factual basis, without proper justification, CARB's gonna sue. And this is a list of some of, of the regulations that we are um, looking at. So the final point I wanna make is enforcement. So if you have air quality rules, if you have climate rules, we need to make sure they're enforced. As with the methane hotspots aerial surveillance, there's new enforcement tools that we should use to start looking at these kind of problems. So for CARB, in light of the VW diesel scandal, we're looking at revised engine certification standards for both cars and for both and trucks. We're also coupling that with intensified in-use in monitoring of the vehicles. This is another key strategy that we're already doing, but we're stepping up. Enforcement's not only good for the air, for public health, it's also good for the people who follow the rules. And so we think a even playing field is a key element of an air quality program. So um, in honor of our uh, 50th anniversary, we uh, have a new logo. We have a new website. We sort of have a new website. We have a lot of classic pages that are carrying over that are being reviewed. Um, but um, if you have any interest, um, our website site's there, and there's a separate link to the climate program, and that'll take you down into all the details and the science behind our different programs. Thanks again for inviting me. Thank you so much, Ellen. Katie. Yes. Thank you, and thank you to the um, Institute for Policy Integrity for having Massachusetts today. I'm here on behalf of my boss, um, Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Matthew Beaton. Um, we are an integrated energy and environment uh, secretariat, so we have both the energy agencies and the environmental agencies under us and have um, sort of used that integration in everything we do, but I think it's been particularly effective on, on the climate change side. So I thought I would take um, the discussion today in a little bit of a different direction and talk about some of the work um, we are doing on the adaptation side of the house, as well as some of the mitigation work we continue to do. Um, our governor, Governor Baker, um, asked us to put together a government-wide strategy for dealing with climate change that integrated both sides of um, of the mitigation equation and how we're preparing and responding and building resiliency across state government. So I thought I would touch a little bit on that uh, government-wide strategy, talk about some of the um, policy framework we work under, knowing that I won't get into any of the nuts and bolts of it because there's a lot of pieces, um, and then just talk a little bit about um, some of the progress we've made to date. So um, I think overall our, our framing vision um, under, under our current administration is to continue to lead the, the nation on reducing emissions um, while we're also preparing for climate change. So what's up here in this 
Venn diagram is just a suite of different um, initiatives we have on either side of the house, on the mitigation and the adaptation side. Um, in the middle is Executive Order 569, which Governor Baker signed a year ago in early September. Um, and this was outlining um, a comprehensive strategy for, for climate change across the state. And you know, I think of myself as a policy person, but what I really do is herd cats. So um, the effort is really trying to bring together all of the parts of state government and make them talk to each other when they're working on climate change. So you know, we, we see climate change as not just an energy and environment issue, but an, an issue that needs to be thought about um, in all of our branches. So our, our more specific goals um, on the mitigation side are really dictated from our Global Warming Solutions Act, um, which was passed in 2008. We have a 25% reduction below 1990 levels. Um, by 2020, we are coming right up on that. And then we have um, an 80% reduction required by 2050. Um, at the same time, on the adaptation side, we've um, made a goal of protecting life, property, natural resources, and the economy as climate change um, continues to impact us. Um, I might make another note that uh, we are a Republican state. We are a state that has joined the Climate Alliance. We were the first bipartisan state to enter. Um, and in Massachusetts, we just, we just don't see climate change as a political issue. So it's something we're working on, um, something we see as both an opportunity for innovation um, and for responding to a critical environmental challenge. So some of the, our operating principles for dealing with this, um, we have a governor who really likes to fix things and to use data and science. And so we've taken that approach um, to addressing climate change. One of the things we're doing is really building up our science resources related to climate so that everything is driven first by having the best science and data in hand when we're making decisions. Um, we're also really interested in policy consistency. So one of the reasons we've integrated our programs is so that as we're working on the mitigation side of things, we're not doing things that would uh, be counter to responding to climate change impacts. Um, and that, that's really a big piece of the work we're doing. It's also looking at things like the investments we're currently making and how they are responsive or not responsive to some of the climate impacts that are being projected. We have a big focus on government leading by example. We've done this um, on the energy side of the house. We have some net zero buildings. We've looked at our fleets. Um, we're looking at building codes and things like that. So we're rolling that over to the resiliency side as well and trying to um, display what should be done in the private sector first um, on the government side. And then I think another, another really big piece of this and something that I think keeps those of us who are working on climate change um, more optimistic is the opportunity to have partnerships um, both with other states, with localities, and then with the private sector to bring in the innovation. We really don't believe we have all the answers or all the resources in Massachusetts state government. Um, so we are part of a number of uh, regional collaboratives, including the Climate Alliance, um, REGI, uh, the Multi-State ZEV Commission, and others. We work um, as part of the New England Governors and Eastern Canadian Premiers Coalition um, and set targets and plan climate change through that, and then we work a lot with the private sector and, and with our cities and towns. So some, some of the policy framework for Massachusetts, um, we do have this nation-leading Global Warming Solutions Act of 2008. Um, it required us to uh, collaborate with other agencies to set those emission limits that I referred to. We currently have them set for 2020 and 2080, I mean 2050. We are also required to set interim limits for 2030 and 2040. We've made a commitment to setting both of those limits um, 10 years out now from when, um, when we hit those. So we will be setting, we are starting to roll um, out the stakeholder process for setting the 2030 emissions limit this year. Um, we also have a very comprehensive um, greenhouse gas emission registry and reporting system run by our Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and we issue every five years a clean energy and climate plan um, as pursuant to this legislation. So we are currently in the, in the similar starting phases of the uh, 2030 plan. Um, and that, that plan spells out the policies and strategies to get us to the targets um, for that year. We have a standing advisory committee um, that helps us do that. And then the act also required us to prepare an adaptation report back in September um, of 2011. And we are now in the process of, of working to update that more comprehensively. 
So from an um, interesting legal side note, in, in Massachusetts recently, um, last, last May, May of 2016, um, the Kane decision, as we refer to it in Massachusetts, um, came down from the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court and their ruling, and this was a cross-administration ruling, so it had been in the administration pr prior to us um, and was ruled on while we were there, was that uh, the Department of Environmental Protection to comply with the Global, Global Warming Solutions Act needed to promulgate regulations to ensure that we were going to meet our 2020 target. Um, so, and the, the specific language of the ruling said that we needed to establish volumetric limits on multiple greenhouse gas emission sources um, in CO2 equivalents, and that those limits had to decline on an annual basis. Um, one of the interesting things about it, and one of the more challenging things about it, is they have to be in-state limits. So that's been um, something we've had to work through in, in um, some of the regional efforts we're part of. But we, as, as, so as part of responding to that ruling, um, and in recognition of some of the other areas I've mentioned, um, the governor did um, sign Executive Order 569 last year. Um, section 2 of that order is very tightly linked to the regulations, and as part of that order, we actually completed six new regulations that were released in August um, of this year. So those are all on the books now and uh, beginning implementation. Um, section 1 of the order spoke to enhancing our mitigation efforts, um, particularly uh, one of the focuses there was in the transportation sector, and I'll touch on that a little bit more in a moment. Um, a very big piece of the order was on adaptation and resiliency, feel like, feeling like we hadn't done much with that yet. It's rolled out a new platform for all of that work. Um, and then a very big piece focused on coordination across state government, as I mentioned. So this slide is just to show you where we are in terms of our um, mitigation goals. I, can't use the can't use the laser pointer like I usually do, um, but we are now as of 2014, and the data the data sort of has um, has to be backdated two years. By the time we get it and process it, there's sort of this two-year lag. So as of 2014, um, we are at 21% of our 1990 reduction. So we're 21% below 1990 levels. Means we have another 4% to hit by 2020. We are um, very confident that we will hit that. Um, the middle two triangles or diamonds that the line doesn't go to are the range under the Paris Agreement, um, which is 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels. We also are well on our way to hit that. And then the final triangles on the outside are the commitment we've made through the New England governors and Eastern Canadian premiers um, to reduce 35 to 45 percent below 1990 levels. So we're keeping track of a lot of in-state and um, and regional targets, and we think we're um, well positioned to hit, to hit all of those, even though there's still um, significant work to be done. We were also part of uh, the Reggie program review and are um, you know, set to implement that moving forward as well. So I mentioned the transportation sector. We really see that as the next challenge we have to wrestle with in terms of mitigation. Um, it now makes up the biggest slice of our pie. Um, and is the only sector projected to increase in emissions based on our inventory work going forward. A number of um, the states here today have talked about it. Um, we uh, are very interested in, in regional solutions to the challenge. We think a state like Massachusetts, a small state um, in a region with lots of cross-border tra uh, travel really needs a regional solution. Um, so we've been participating in a number of um, such forums. We also recognize at the same time as we need a regional solution, we need to pull up um, the feedback from the state. So we are starting a listening tour this fall to collect um, all of the input from state stakeholders on what regional policy solutions look like, how to best deploy EVs across the state to meet our targets, um, how to build a more resilient transportation network, and then the final piece, which I think is really critical, um, we see as being really critical, is how to deal with rural drivers and environmental justice communities and how to make this a really equitable system that works. So that's um, something that we are excited to be working on um, going into the fall. <clears throat> how am I doing on time? You're doing very well. You have two minutes left. Two minutes left. Sorry, five minutes. Five minutes left. Okay. I was going to focus on adaptation, but I, I ran out here. Um, 
So uh, a number of things are, um, are stemming from Governor Baker's order on the adaptation side of the house. Um, one of them was to complete an integrated plan um, to deal with, to utilize the best science to look at climate risk and then to um, determine adaptation strategies and really operationalize those strategies. So we had a sense that, that our plan from 2011 had a number of really good goals, had sort of a good inventory of, one of the key, what the key impacts would be, but really lacked um, a clear path to implementation. So who was going to take the lead? Who was going to pay for it? Where was the money coming from? What were the most feasible strategies in the short term? What did we need to look at in the long term? Um, and so we, we really felt like we needed a new plan. And one of the things we did that we've been um, really excited about is partner with our emergency management agency in Massachusetts and to create an integrated natural hazard mitigation plan and climate adaptation plan. So we're trying to do it um, in a seamless way that's not just greenwashing an existing plan. There's some wrinkles there, but um, we are working through it. And as part of that, have um, completed a framework for agencies to go through vulnerability assessments. So all of our agencies will go through that. This looks a lot like um, what was done under the Obama administration with the federal agencies. So it's sort of all tearing up into an overall plan. Um, and then through that, we were able to get uh, state level projections on climate data downscale to the watershed level across the state. So we've really been working to build that platform of, of science and data. We've taken a big focus on stakeholders in that process, um, pulling together a lot of different groups to, to give input into that. Um, and I think another, another principle for us is that um, climate change should really be mainstreamed into all of the planning work we do. Um, and so that has been a big focus, working across secretariats to bring the climate data and knowledge into those existing planning frameworks. Uh, maybe a last quick highlight. Um, we're also a state that really values, a state and an administration that really values local and state partnerships. Um, and so this past spring, as part of the executive order, we rolled out a new program um, where cities and towns are able to go through a stakeholder focused planning process to start looking at their vulnerability and identifying key action steps. Um, and we actually were um, very excited. We got 20% of our cities and towns to enroll in the program. It's a small grants program. They go through a planning process. It has to be led by um, a core team, including elected officials at the town level. Um, once they go through it, they get designation this gives them higher standing in state grant programs, so the implementation, they get a leg up on the implementation through existing state funding streams. Um, the Nature Conservancy has been a key partner to us on this, um, is actually looking to help roll it out in other states. We're also working with the Climate Alliance to look at it as a best practice that could be rolled out in other states. I think I've covered most of this, just that the uh, big focus for us is on science. Um, and we are interested in sharing that science, particularly with um, states that border us and, and can use it. So we have a new website coming out. It's actually built on a framework that came from NACERTA. So again, um, this sort of state-to-state -state partnership and leveraging resources. Um, but this website will be live in October and should have all of the work we're doing sort of nicely packaged up and available for repackaging. So I will end. <laughs> um, I don't think I don't think think Thank you, Katie, and, and thanks to all of you. That was fantastic. Um, thank you all for your questions. I'm going to start with the first three questions, and then folks can tackle them however they feel like. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can in the 17 minutes that we have before <laughs> a break. Um, so first three questions. This one was directed towards Leslie, but I think it's actually quite interesting for everyone. Could you talk a bit more about incentivizing private forest owners as well as public lands to do more for carbon sequestration? And just as a sort of gloss on that question, I don't know how many of you have poured over the mid-century strategy that was developed last fall uh, to talk about how we're going to meet our mid-century climate goals, but a major, major component of that mid-century strategy, which showed that we could meet very aggressive decarbonization goals, was the land use sector and land use change to um, try to 
have more sequestration happening uh, in, our, in our lands, which to some degree means a lot of afforestation, um, which is something the East Coast has done before. So um, that's question one. Question two, in light of the devastating impacts from the hurricanes we've seen recently, as well as the wildfires that are ongoing, can you talk a little bit about the adaptation work that is ongoing in your state or what you would like to see? Katie, you touched on this a bit at, at the end, but um, we can talk more about that. And then the third question is about uh, any programs to increase electrification for heating and heat pumps. So the three questions are adaptation, land use change to support carbon sequestration, and electrification of heating. Anybody want to go first? I can, I can talk Great. about the uh, forestry um, connection. So just to be clear, and, and by way of background, um, our, we have a, a commission called the Oregon Global Warming Commission that uh, tasked a, a group of uh, academic experts um, from our university system, uh, as well as partnerships with the US Forest Service um, to create a, a, a task force on um, forest carbon accounting. And so the, the main uh, policy work that's being done on forest carbon uh, storage in Oregon has been to, to produce an inventory based on the latest uh, science uh, and uh, uh, analysis of uh, trends over time and to create kind of a baseline of what do we know about our forests right now and how much carbon they are capturing, um, both gross uh, and also net given that uh, there's harvesting, active harvesting going on in Oregon, as well as just general tree mortality and wildfire events that, uh, that kill trees and, and take out that forest carbon. Um, and the, the preliminary results of that task force were that um, Oregon's forests are, have a net forest carbon capture of 36 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Um, which is quite significant. Um, it's, a, it's a matrix of, state of ownership of the forest lands in Oregon. So there are few state-owned lands. Um, it's primarily a federally owned forests, so Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management uh, ownership and management. Um, and then there are the private industrial forest lands where you have the active uh, timber harvesting going on, and then there's private non-industrial forest land. And so the, the land use planning that I was referring to in my talk was really capturing some of this idea of, of keeping forests as forests and having the private non-industrial uh, forest lands, uh, you know, having some, some way of protecting them from um, just rampant development kind of things. Um, there are no particular incentives that, that are happening or, or under discussion for um, private ma forest management um, for carbon capture. Uh, I think that as we move towards um, looking at systems of carbon pricing and the carbon offset uh, programs, particularly I know there are uh, protocols for, for doing forestry carbon offsets uh, in California that we could potentially look at. Um, so that will be a more active discussion moving forward about how this will work in Oregon, but currently there are no incentives. We're in a similar, uh, similar position. Um, our current clean energy and climate plan doesn't look at land-based or biogenic emissions, so that's something we are looking at um, sort of on this science and data approach of can we get a good inventory of where we are in terms of um, sequestration. Um, on, the, on the forest side, we are 65% forested in Massachusetts, but we are losing forest, um, 65 acres, I think, on a, on a daily basis. A new report just came out. Um, so it's definitely an area where I think there is some, there's innovation in other states and there's a lot of innovation in the private sector around um, mitigation from forests. So it's, it's an active area for us. I think the other thing we're looking at that fits well with, with the forestry question is how can we find more of these strategies that have the co-benefits of adaptation and mitigation and, and forestry is, um, forest uh, management is a, obvi a very obvious um, solution to that. So I think from a, a watershed protection um, and a, a flood, floodplain forest protection scale, as well as the carbon sequestration um, gains, it's an, it's an area of active interest for us. Do you wanna go? So in, in California, um, one of the things that the Global Solutions Act of 2006 required CARB to do was to do a scoping plan. 
So we did a scoping plan initially, we did an update, and then we were um, asked to do another one by the legislature to meet our 2030 goals. So one of the areas in there is natural and working lands. And we put in working lands because it's range land, other, other types of lands. And our scoping plan is, uh, there's a draft will come out um, later this um, year, a revised draft to deal with some of the, of the new requirements the legislature asked us to look at. But it's gonna come out with a range of, of programs. And again, it's gonna be a, a combination of incentives and, uh, and, and, and regulations to address some of these things. Some of them will not be by the Air Board, it'll be by other uh, state agencies in California. But the scoping plan kind of gives us an idea of where we wanna go, you know, a directional view in, in collaboration with all the other state um, and local agencies. It's an open public process. One of the things you need to think about, and, and both Katie and Leslie referred to, is the research behind this. We don't know a lot about, um, uh, about how trees work. What's the impact of wildfires? Is it better to have a wildfire or not? And that is, um, there's actually um, a whole group of people that rush out to wildfires in California now and start collecting data, okay? So we have a good uh, uh, coordination with our academic partners to look at that because it's a really, um, um, an interesting topic of, of how do you proceed with that. Uh, Leslie referred to our offsets protocols. So forests were not part of the um, cap, it's under the cap, but it's not part of the cap and trade program. But you can have volunteer partners that can put themselves in the cap and trade program and offsets are one of the things that they do. So we have um, mining methane offsets, which tend to come from Colorado, believe it or not. Uh, the forestry ones are actually something that the tribes have used because it fits in with what they want to do with their lands. And you have to commit to have your forest in the program for um, 100 years. You have to have uh, there's a insurance in case there is a forest fire. So it's a very complicated protocol that we developed with some of our partners and that you can actually use it to generate compliance level uh, certificates for, for cap and, and trade. So there are different ways to do this. But once again, there's a lot of innovation. Uh, the methane one came, uh, the mine one, came from private sector. So I didn't emphasize that uh, very much in my comments, but the business people are coming up with great ideas. And then the question is, is how do the regulatory agencies incentivize those to, to keep pushing it forward? In Virginia, um, Several governors back several administrations set up a climate uh, task force to take a look at all of these issues that we've been talking about here in a holistic way. There's been a strategy to conserve land uh, in Virginia. Um, and I think a one-upmanship by succeeding um, uh, administrations to see how much more land can be conserved. So, the, the view is that there are a lot of opportunities uh, for the public uh, private sectors to work uh, holistically to address the many impacts of climate uh, that have been recognized. And, and you mentioned a number of them, uh, including associated with um, sea level rise. I mean, that's a, a greatly, greatly uh, important issue for Virginia and the Hampton Roads area, for example. Uh, the increasing volatile uh, weather events. I mean, I was in the State Department back in the 1990s at a meeting, and they were predicting events like we're seeing now at that meeting, and we were having a climate change conversation. Um, and I walked out and I thought, this is like sci-fi. Well, a couple of decades later, uh, we're seeing some of that. And so that um, is very much a part of the discussion and a consideration of different strategies. Uh, there is an interest in uh, considering uh, these impacts on the agricultural center. You know, rural areas, small farm, uh, small farmlands, uh, water sh uh, shortages. I mean, we've also talked about uh, the, you know, health issues, heat, and impacts on the workforce. So there are a lot of issues right now on the table, and some of the, um, and other things, general welfare issues like, like wildfires, uh, and, and the like, and so uh, the discussion around um, approaches, and I discussed one, the regulations uh, that I went through in detail, that's one piece of a broader strategy. Uh, when the work group was set up um, to look at 
um, how to implement uh, the uh, governor's executive order, you had the Commerce Department sitting at that table. It's not just uh, what you would expect um, uh, the environment uh, secretary, but others throughout the government because the, the business uh, sector, the private sector, uh, can be a very important player here. We've been talking about inno innovative approaches. Um, we've been talking about market-based uh, approaches as well and all of the opportunities on the renewable side. So th that's also a driver and I think an important driver. The, the government can do, <laughs> uh, can do so much, but um, there is a lot of investment. Um, my uh, co-panelist Leslie mentioned the science critically important work is going on on the, um, on the um, you know, analysis of how we're going to address all these issues. Uh, there are also uh, issues, I think, that um, a little bit outside what we've been talking about, but that we are keeping an eye on, and that is uh, there's a land water conservation fund uh, that has traditionally been funded uh, for many, many, many years. Those are issues uh, that are before uh, the Congress now. Will it continue to be funded? Um, is it going to be permanent? At what level will this be funded? And you ask, why is that important? It's important because it's a piece of the puzzle of conserving lands by uh, nonprofit groups, um, such as the Trust for Public Land, and with all due disclosure, I'm on that board. Uh, but um, um, so, so there's a lot going on, and in, in the state of Virginia, there is and has been an interest in taking a look at holistic approaches, because we're going to need all of that to address um, all of the uh, challenges we're facing, but also to meet the opportunities uh, that we're facing. Um, in Virginia, there is a focus on, on jobs, there's a focus on developing uh, clean energy, um, and there's a lot of excitement about what that could mean for our economy, which has been defense-based, <laughs> to be truthful, um, with, uh, with the great challenges we face on, on the climate side and how we're going to address uh, those important um, you know, uh, public health, safety, and welfare uh, issues. So I'm going I'm to throw out the last set of, of questions, but people should feel free to go back and talk more about adaptation or heat pumps if they, if they want. But in our last round here, um, four, four new topics. One, as we talk about electrifying the transportation sector, that obviously means an increase in power generation so that we can take over basically the energy production for an entire sector of the economy. Um, so where is that electricity going to come from, or I assume what types of sources? Uh, any updates on programs in your states that are efforts to capture and use the methane from landfills or wastewater treatment for use as biogas or renewable natural gas? I might throw in a plug for Washington, D.C. There's not a lot good that's happening there right now, but they are building a state-of-the-art waste treatment plant that is going to capture methane and use it for productive uses, in case you didn't know. Uh, third question, any plans to utilize the Volkswagen settlement funds, uh, or what, could you talk more about the plans to use those funds for electrification, infrastructure, or other decarbonization efforts? And then final question, if anybody wants to comment on the recent lawsuit filed by San Francisco uh, tackling major greenhouse gas financial interests, um, oil companies uh, under the local state nuisance laws. We're seeing a sort of increase in action under nuisance law right now at the state level. Uh, and if anybody wants to, it, this might be a little bit challenging for this group to opine on that, but we are seeing more activity in that area. I can jump back towards to uh, the heat pumps just so that person doesn't feel left out. Um, but <laughs> there, there are no specific heat pump programs per se, but I think that, uh, that in Oregon we definitely recognize the importance of not only electrifying transportation but also electrifying the home. So if we're talking about moving our energy uh, system towards the clean energy future and decarbonizing the electric sector, we need to also decarbonize and electrify uh, everything else. And so 
um, electric heat pumps are, are certainly a piece of that, um, and, we, and we do kind of recognize that as part of the package. Uh, for uh, electric power generation and where does that come from, I think a point on the, that I can just reiterate from the previous panel is that um, there has been sort of decreased load now as more energy efficiency and conservation measures have taken hold, and so it's not necessarily that by ele electrifying transportation you're adding a whole new burden, you know, or something to the uh, electric uh, uh, system, and I think that um, many utilities see this as an opportunity to kind of make up for what's been lost, per se. Um, and then on the landfill methane capture and wastewater, we do have um, all of those programs ongoing in Oregon, and we uh, at the Department of Energy are, are starting on a, uh, an inventory of biogas um, and renewable natural gas opportunities in the state. Um, so taking advantage of, of some of the, the agriculture that we have um, in, as uh, potential sources of biogas and renewable natural gas. And then um, we will be talking more about uh, the VW settlement funds, but that's sort of an ongoing discussion with the legislature. So I'm not going to go into that, and I'm definitely not gonna go into the nuisance law. <laughs> <laughs> I'll join you on that. Yeah, that sounds what I would hit on um, as well. I think, you know, we um, have also been looking at the line of our building sector. It's sort of at a flatlining point. It's not projected to increase or decrease, just kind of to hang where it is. Um, but, uh, you know, as my analysts will tell me, the transportation sector is actually a lot more flexible than the building sector. Just, look, just looking at straight turnover of a vehicle versus a heat pump, uh, you know, a heating source in a home, there's a 30 years maybe for the life of a heat source and 10 years or so for the average lifespan of a vehicle. So we do see that as a sector where we need to um, make some, some definite progress and, and work to really electrify that. Um, we did have uh, bipartisan legislation last year, um, last summer, the governor signed energy legislation calling for um, 1,800 megawatts of offshore wind and another 1,200 megawatts of class one renewables. So we really are um, looking to make, um, you know, increased renewables part of the uh, um, power generation mix um, in the state to address that. Um, in terms of VW, that's also an active discussion, how we're going to deploy that, so. So um, with respect to um, electrification of the, uh, the demand of transportation, I think it depends, as the panel said this morning, how many renewables you have. So I think, once again, if you can, if you can match up an increase of renewable portfolio, which we're doing in California and many other states are doing, um, in terms of the sources of electricity and then match that up with your electrification of transportation unit, you're gonna hit a sweet spot and at some point the batteries are gonna start serving as storage overnight. So if you can set up your electric, you know, your grid to go back and forth, you can actually um, use that. So I think once again, these, as these are all, these technologies are, are developing simultaneously and so you just have, if your goal, ultimate goal is electrification and also to move to renewables, you can ratchet that and set incentives and requirements to move along. We're not gonna get there in one second, but we're gonna get there you know, over time, and we just have to have a, um, a strategy going um, forward. Um, in terms of the, uh, of the electrification of the uh, wastewater and uh, methane, the renewable natural gas that Leslie just mentioned is really um, interesting because that's also, once again, just like renewable diesel, once you start having a market for it, then it starts to, and pipelines that can transport it. So that's one thing we're doing with pilot projects with methane out of dairies that can be moved to landfills where you can start putting these into pipelines and using also that for, um, for transportation fuels. They get an incentive for that under the low carbon fuel standard program in, in California. Um, the one note on the nuisance suit, um, I won't talk about the, the merits of the suits that just um, filed, but I'd like to remind people of the suits that were initiated a couple of years ago that were dismissed, and one of the things that the court was focusing on was that the federal government was taking action at that point. So I just want to remind people about that fact um, as you're looking at the current cases. Um, Volkswagen. Um, there's minimal uh, ability to use um, electrification in the Volkswagen settlement. Um, as some people know, our engineers were the ones that found that problem. 
um, and figured out how to trick the car into showing its DeVeet device, why it's on the dyno. Um, just totally cool. The guy is great, and there was duct tape involved. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've been best around the he had a long commute. He was in L.A. It worked out fine. Um, so suddenly the laptop went, whoops, you know. Um, and so anyway, but when you looked at what that money is to be spent for, if you go back, it's, it was excess NOx that was emitted. And so, um, the, so most of the money, is the plans that each state has to come up with for the mitigation money is supposed to address NOx. And you have to talk about that. Electrification, you can actually quantify if you're moving um, sources from one to the other. There are um, infrastructure uh, for light duty cars that are, isn't allowed in there. So it's a state discussion. You just have to remember that you have to account. It's a mitigation fund. You have to account for your, for your NOx. But as a, that is a possibility there for both heavy duty um, and light duty. Nothing to add. Excellent. I hope you all will join me in thanking this panel for a really terrific discussion.